awesome intro time. What you probably got to do? What? Welcome, guys. It's your boy, Japanese Tutor. Back at it again. <laughs> this time we're going to cover the Stonewall Dutch and what you should be doing. All right, so I'm going to read right from the book. Uh, the Stonewall is one of the only openings or one of the few openings where black achieves an immediate advantage in space. The sound on the in intro is so much louder than your voice. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. I, I won't do that with a warning. Okay, so in the book, I'm, and I'm reading from the text, uh, your chiropractor. What's up? I need some. <laughs> Thank you for following. Um, allow us to present three games, which we believe are quite instructive, in addition to being good advertisements for the uh, Stowall Dutch. We advise you first to have a quick look just to get a first impression without bothering much about precise variations and nuances, then go through the games once more, paying more attention to the notes, in particular when you wonder what's going on. So this is an inspirational game A. This is by Anansen versus Milvang in 2008. Right now, this is a lesson. This is a lesson right now. Just we just started it, so you came at, at the perfect time. So all right, let's do this. So we're gonna go right into it. So D four and then F five. This is starting the Dutch, right? The Dutch defense. The Dutch defense a so named due to the Dutch player and theorist uh, Elias Stein. He lived from 1748 to 1812, who published a treatise on it. And uh, quite likely it's Black's most unbalancing reaction to D4. Black weakens his king side somewhat and doesn't develop anything, but he claims the E4 square and some king side territory and will soon catch up in development if white continues quietly. Knight f3. Knight f6. G3. A king being kettle is a good idea against the Dutch, as it tends to make it harder for black to develop his light squared bishop, but considering that this game was played in a club championship, the move is actually slightly surprising. Many club level players prefer c4 or even less theoretical moves like bishop f4, e3, or bishop g5. So guys, um, I, I like what the book is doing because it shows you both sides, right? It shows you black's best try, and it shows you what white can do against black's best try. And it's like a battle of ideas like I've always been saying. So I'm liking the introduction in this book so far. Um, e6. Bishop g2, d5, exclamation point, exclam. This is the characteristic stonewall formation. So guys, remember this. This is the characteristic of a stonewall formation. There's a question here. I don't plan to play the stonewall as black. Will it be worthwhile for me to follow the lessons? We are confident that these lessons will improve your general understanding of some important positional themes, in particular about flank play, when the center is stable, but also how a theoretically bad bishop occasionally can be a superior to a theoretically good one. Okay, I like what they're trying to play at here. Um, let's just keep going. On a more concrete level, the lessons will be useful if you plan to play the, some other Dutch variation, 
lessons 8 to 12 co cover common ground for all Dutch lines. In addition, a good grounding in how to, to handle the Stonewall central formation will be handy as d5 is the best recipe for black in many lines in the classical Dutch. Even in the Leningrad, you will get some related pawn structure. So this is really important. Understanding some openings, even if they're not your openings or the openings you play, it can be helpful because you can use that knowledge in some other positions. So I really like where this book is going. The stonewall structure is so is also an important part of another opening, the semi-slav triangle. Or wedge system. Okay. So let's let's go over the wedge system. The D4, D5, C4, C6. Knight F3. E6. And if you can do E3 or G3 here, um, you can either play F5 or Bishop G6 here. But let's not go and delve too deep into this. We're going to go back to the position that we had before. Okay, and uh, he plays castles. And now uh, bishop d6. This active de development of the bishop was Black's idea when he played the somewhat inflexible d5 on his fourth move. Okay. It makes an exchange via a3 harder to achieve, but encourages white to seek the exchange of dark square bishops on f4. So we want the bishop to come here. Oops, here, so we can try to trade off at some later point. c4, c6. And this is the Dutch defense, a classical stonewall variation. Late to the party. What's the name of the book? Uh, hold on. I think it's just called the Stonewall Dutch. Stonewall Dutch. All right, let's go back. <clears throat> Black completes his... Uh, stonewall pawn chain, securing a firm central grip. This is the real starting point of the Dutch modern stonewall. It's our ambition, or the book's ambition, uh, to provide black with a complete repertoire based on th this defense. Question. It's right in the book. Will you consider all of black's main options so that this book is useful also for those who primarily want to prepare to face the stone wall as white. Okay, here's the answer. The stone wall is more an ideas opening than most. We are convinced that these lessons will make you more successful also when facing it with white. Yet these lectures are primarily intended to offer black a flexible repertoire. So at the crucial points, we generally offer black one or two options normally one that is well explored and one which is more experimental in addition we shall often point out moves for black worthy of independent research i'm in love with this book so far um i like the approach they're going out hopefully they can provide some great content but it already seems like they're already uh foreshadowing a lot of good content so knight bd2 so this is considered harmless. However, it is quite likely that uh, these guys were aware of a win by Magnus Carlsen with this move a few months earlier, since this game was played um, in Norway. In passing, we would like to show 
one of the very first games with the modern stone wall. Okay, and we're just gonna go through this game. Gets queen c. Wait. So instead of playing knight bd2, you play queen c2. Castles. This and this is a a game. Like one of the f first like main games in the modern th Stonewall. Uh, b3. Knight e4. Modern theory prefers queen e7 instead. Yeah, queen e7. Uh, bishop b2. Uh, bishop a3 is actually su supposed to uh, exploit the inaccuracy. So the reason you don't play knight f the reason you don't play knight e4 first is because you're supposed to play bishop a3, right? So you want this queen instead to come here first. So instead of so that's a good thing to note as well. And so instead of knight e4 immediately, um, maybe you can play queen e7 to stop it, and then you can always play knight e4 after. Okay, but they played this. Knight e4 here. It should be two. Um, knight d7, knight e5, queen f6, f3, question mark, knight captures e5, d captures e5 is a mistake, they said that, uh, if f captures e4, knight g4, e5, queen h6, threatening mate, is also bad for white. So let's see what they, what happens. So captures, captures, uh, I think it's Bishop c5 check. King h1. Knight captures g3 check. And this is uh, made in two because of, in view of this. Checkmate. That's a nice little trap to, to have in your repertoire. Let's look at that again. That is a really nice trap. So, if queen f6, and then they try to play f3 saying, hey, get your knight out of there. It doesn't belong there. Get out of my house. You can be like, okay, you get out of my house. And then they say, hey, I have a double attack, right? And you're like, no, I have a double attack. So they think, okay, you might just go here. You win an exchange, whatever. But you're like, I don't want to win an exchange. I want to win the game. <laughs> and then, you know, they have nowhere to go because this bishop cuts off this line. You're hitting it here, so the king has nowhere to go. He has to make some space or protect. Um, remember what we learned in our first lesson, how to get out of check. It's a CPR, capture, protect, run. You cannot capture the queen. You cannot run away, so the only option left is to protect. After you protect, bam. Cannot capture the queen. You cannot run. All of these squares are mine. And, yeah. Very nice, very nice. Okay, so let's go back to the um, original position where he played uh, knight bd2. That was a really that was a really nice game to to understand. Oh Ray, you got better. You watched all the lessons. That's awesome. Just keep, just keep. It's a progression thing. Just. You'll get better as the more you do, the better you're going to get at it. Like, I was horrible at chess when I first started. And believe me, like, bad. Like, what, what was one of my key mistakes when I was when I was starting chess? I think, oh, <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> a friend and I were playing during lunchtime. And... He had his king, and I had a king and a pawn. So I didn't know how to push a pawn. I didn't know how to checkmate. So my king kept going next to his king, and I'm like, well, I keep getting you in check, so I must win. 
And he's like, I guess, yeah. So that, looking back at it now, was very funny. Because <laughs> we were like kind of rivals. So I won up them there. Now nah, I, I was bad. All right, so let's let's get back to the text. Um, knight bd2, castles, knight e5, knight bd7. Okay. Don't be too hasty to play knight e4. Um, and this is Carlson versus uh, Krasnikow in uh, 2007. And they continued with uh, b6. Oops. Oh, so he didn't play knight bt7. He played b6. b6, knight df3. And what Carlson's playing the white pieces. Knight e4, queen c2, bishop b7. Reaching a position considered via a different move order in the note to white's eighth move in game 13. Okay, so we'll learn this position at a later date. All right, great. So let's go back to the knight bd7. Um, he played knight df3 immediately. So, I mean, he was going to play that anyway. That was his move. And this is actually pretty good. This this play is like 1,500, this, this play, the black player. But I guess it's the Stonewall Dutch is considered to be a very easy opening to learn. Um, knight e4. And then black play, white plays knight captures e7 which is a it says it's kind of an inaccuracy and the text says this further this furthers black's development and exchanges a well-placed knight which has moved twice for one which has only moved once and i always say this if they move a piece twice or three times in the opening and you can move all of your other pieces and then they take something at the end it's worth it like that knight, the knight that was just here, it only moved once. He had to go one, two, and then three, right? So now we're up a tempi or two, depending on how you want to count. And tempi, for those of you who are new to chess or new to the channel, tempi is time in chess. So basically how many moves it takes. So like, let's say you attack a queen with a pawn. The, pawn, the queen has to do something. So you're making the queen move away. And then you effectively gain time. Because now you can move another piece. Um, so continue on with the text. Even though it was a simultaneous game. Uh, he wants to give a. He wants to give a note. That. Bishop f4, knight captures e5. Bishop captures e5. Bishop, no, queen e7, queen c2. Rook d8. c5. Bishop captures e5. Knight captures e5. Knight g5. Knight d3. Queen f6. e3. Bishop d7. b4. Knight f7. And f4. Oh, what, something happened. Sorry. Anime t1. Or Anamite 1, however you say your name. I'm sorry if I mispronounce it. And welcome. Welcome to the stream and thank you for following. Um, And did I enjoy the rain today? No, it, it woke me up. It was like, Pshh! it came down. It was like somebody was just like, had the hose on. And it was like, it was bad. It was really bad. <laughs> Like sitting on your porch and watching the rain. Yeah, it's it's really re a relaxing feeling. Um, and so he notes that uh, it has a small advantage to white. And this is Kasparov versus Tamir. And uh, it's a simultaneous match. But it's still worth noting. 
still worth noting. Um, so try to keep this in your in your brain somewhere. Um, this position. Kasparov, if you guys do not know, is one of the best, or probably the best chess player that whoever lived. Um, now Magnus Carlsen, you know, is number one world champion, but you know they didn't have all the technology that we have now, and not not taken away from Magnus Carlsen or anything, but they 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 were amazing. Just the the moves that they played, but but I digress. <laughs> Uh, bishop captures d7. b3. Queen e8. Okay, so now let's think about what queen e8 is planning. I So he just played queen e8 immediately, but let's what is queen e8 planning? To maybe come to the queen side? Because I would have played... I would have considered queen e7 instead. Or maybe b queen a5. Right? Because he has a dark square bishop, so maybe to dampen this. Right? Because my knight's also doing a good job of controlling dark squares. Maybe my bishop can come in as well. Or maybe I can reroute my bishop later. Right? So that that's what I was considering. But queen e8, that's interesting. I don't know if this is the best move, but again, this is only a 1500, but it's all, it's supposed to be an instructive game. Maybe he wants to go on the queen side, I mean, the, on the king side and attack. Um, okay, so b3, queen e8, bishop b2, rook d8. It's not all that clear that this is the best square for the rook. And black should consider f4 or a5, making something positive of the rook on a8. So instead of this, um, he should he should really consider this move to tie down some squares over here and maybe gain some space. Or the text gives f4 as well. I like the space gaining move. Maybe, eh, I don't know. Okay, so uh, white plays c5. Ooh, actually, sorry, after rook d8, white plays c5. And this pawn advance is frequently applauded when played by a grandmaster, especially if he wins. And invariably criticized when played by a lesser light. This is not as unfair as it sounds, as GMs are liable to show better judgment with this tempting but highly committal move, right? Because you're changing the pawn structure, right? Instead of having this protect this now, this is now a target. This is the base of your pawn chain. And let me go back but highly committal move which diffuses the central tension and turns the game into a race between two wing attacks so now white says hey i'm ready to attack i'm going to attack on the queen side you're going to attack you're going to attack on the king side all right so bishop c7 b4 starting the attack and then g5 saying hey i'm going to attack you right back so this is kind of getting exciting. It's like, hey, who's this? I'm attacking you. You're attacking me. Let's do this. Yeah, this rook here is not really doing much. I would have kept it here. Alright. Now, superficially, g5 may seem weakening. But the, with the center closed, uh, black is obliged to create kingside play. He has to. If the normal thing is if if somebody's attacking on the side, you attack on the other side or in the center. If somebody's attacking in the center, you attack on one of the sides. You know, chess is really balanced in, in that if you're attacking on the side, usually you have some chances elsewhere. Usually. Unless you're playing Karpov, because he likes to play on both sides of the board. <clears throat> 
All right, so 95. Knight f6. Now, this move isn't particularly easy to understand as king h8 or queen h5 uh, are more obvious options. But probably the knight is attracted to the g4 square. Okay. That makes sense. Knight captures d7. First of all, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me stop right there. That bishop is so bad, I wouldn't give a pawn for it right now. Why are you taking that bishop? That, this bishop is a tall pawn, right? Do you see this? It can't move anywhere. It can go back and forth, back and forth. I need to move this queen one, two, three moves to get it open. And then this is not even an effective diagonal. And then rook captures c7. Um, oh, so I'll go with the text. For the second time, white helps black's mobilization with an exchange. It may seem logical to remove a light square attacker as white may have to play e3 at some point, but chances are good that there will be a better opportunity. What? <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll watch the clip later. <laughs> Thank you for clipping that. Hopefully, I don't sound like an idiot. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Brandon. Gotta feel like I'm in the eye of the storm. <laughs> um, okay, so here he plays e3. Oh, after rook takes. After rook takes, he plays e3. And I was, now, now it's getting kind of dicey. White delays. Uh... Queen h5, right? So you can't play queen h5. And as well as f4, right? Because I can't play f4 so effectively. But weakens his kingside light square, his kingside light squares, which in the long run contributes to his downfall. So we'll see here. Queen g6. I think the, the much better move here, maybe is h5. Just playing immediately, just h5. And I think black is just destroying here. But, okay. g6. Queen d3. Queen h5. Right, because that was... We were playing that the whole time. Queen d1. Queen h6. Great. We stay on the diagonal. Um, Maybe queen e2 is fine. Oh, yep, queen e2. Knight g4. Interesting mark. Where it's question mark and then it's uh, exclamation and question mark. Black invests two tempi in provoking a further weakness in pawn's cover. It, white, sorry. A weakness in white's pawn cover. This decision is open to dispute. But it cannot be denied that black's finishing combination depends on the weakening of g3. So h3. Knight f6. Right? So we invested this one move just so he plays here. Now this pawn's a little bit weaker. Now this it comes out a little bit, weakens this pawn, right? And it can never protect this square again. Now we have a new target. h3. Knight f6, a4. White's queenside progress is slow, but so is black's on the king side. But while white is playing for a position or advantage, which ultimately may win a pawn or two, black is playing for mate. And there's a definite possibility that both players may succeed in their ambitions. So, knight e4. Bishop captures. Okay, so this guy just doesn't understand to come like at all. He just doesn't understand chess. Why are you giving up that bishop? This knight is okay. It is attacking two pieces, right? Great. Maybe bishop captures and whatever, right? If you're so scared, you can play this move. 
Okay, anyways. So, what he says. A black central knight is strong. Arguably stronger than the light square bishop. Nevertheless, it seems a positional misevaluation to give away an important... Hold on. Let me make sure I read this. Important kingside defender. While opening the F file for black and presenting him with co control over F3, there is no immediate tactical punishment, but now black definitely has better chances. So takes, takes, and now I have control over this square. King G2. I would wedge something right into F3, yeah. Put something right into F3 so he can't move this ever again. Bishop c3. Now this bishop is garbage. Rook df7. Very nice. Very nice play. b5. He's still attacking here. But I don't think he has any chances anymore. And then queen h5. Threatening check, right? Hmm. Maybe a better move is to like make a, a gun here. It's his game. I'll let him play. And then he plays Rook A E one. Boy. Rook A E one. Okay, this allows an elegant finish, and obviously must be a mistake. But White's defensive task is extremely difficult, as these variations illustrate. He says that if Queen B two. Instead, you have rook 3 to f6. And white cannot deal with the threat of this. Queen f3 check. Followed by um, g4. And then bishop catches g3. So, okay, so I'll just play the variation out for you. Um, so let's say he plays rook a1. Queen f3 check. King g1. If he plays king h2, then we have uh, rook h6. And it's checkmate in five moves. And I'll just play this out for you, no matter what he plays. Um, so it's going to be queen f5. Uh, he has to stop check here. He can't push, right? Because the bishop is pinning the pawn. So then he has to give up the queen. Give me that. h4. Rook captures h4 because he can't take. King g1. And then uh, queen h3. It's going to finish the game. Because, again, if he takes, this bishop is not controlling that square, so we can checkmate him. And the king is out of squares. And after queen c2, I mean, you could, yeah, after queen c2, let's say, rook 7 f6. Rook 7 f6 instead. If, wait, oops, oops. Go back, go back. So if queen c2, then you should play rook 7 f6. And what can I defend simultaneous threats against the h and the f files? Very nice. Very, very, very nice. He gives uh, b6, a captures b, rook a b1, bishop captures g3, f captures g3, 
rook h6, rook h1, rook captures g3 check. Sorry, I lost myself. Okay. King captures g3. King f. Wow. If king f1, uh, then we have rook f6. Oops. Rook f6. King d2, then we have rook f2. If he takes his checkmate, and then yeah, we can we can checkmate from here. But uh, yeah, this is this is dead. Insane, insane lines here. All the lines. So let's go back. Um, so I mean, we, we pretty much get the ideas. Um, but there's there is one defense that it has here. Rook a two is the only defense, the only white only defense. Um, he could stop playing bad moves. That's another defense. But after g four. Rook H1. Um, and also he notes that H4 is met by the decisive. Where is it? Bishop catches G3. Right? Because we're, we're going to take this for free. Not for free, but. Um, so rook a2, rook h1, here, rook h1, and then queen g5, queen e1, queen f5, Rook b2. G catches h3. Rook captures h3. And then h5. And it seems that black will eventually break through. B captures c6. B captures c6. And then queen e2. King g7. I don't. I don't think he has to play that, but I. I think that. I mean, you have so much compensation here. Like you can win outright, no? Hmm. Wait, well, that doesn't work. <laughs> so let me just show you the end of this game. So, b captures, b captures, b captures c6, b captures c6. King g7, queen e1. King G6. Queen E2. She, he's just waiting for moves. Queen G5. Bishop E1. Protecting everything. And after Bishop E1. E5. And it has more sample lines, but we get the idea. Black is totally winning. Uh, actually, let's go through them. Let's go through them. Bishop, queen a6. 
queen f is here. We're going to crash. Oh, actually, the queen's on g5 instead of that. Queen g5. Bam, bam. And then we played e5, queen a6. Queen, queen f6, queen c8. And e captures d4. Queen g8 check. Rook g7. Queen e8 check. Queen f7. Queen captures c6 check. Rook f6. Queen b5. It looks like the queen's doing some work. And then d captures e3. f captures e3. Rook f3. Getting back into the position to attack everything. Queen a6 check. I think my king is just going to go back. a7. Queen e2. Bishop e5. Rook b4. And then queen g6. Threatening the whole house. Like, let's say if here then like we have a lot of like queen g4 attacks a lot of stuff what do you play rook c6 yeah i don't know i think rook captures g3 is is a killer what do you play if you play here then i have like uh this this captures check you what are you going to do bishop g3 i'm going to capture it on g3 this is not a queen yet, right? And this is probably going to be a checkmate threat. Hello. Easy stuff. Okay. All right. So let's go back all the way to rookie, rookie one. <laughs> That was a really good line to go over, though. Like, shows how you can crash through. Just played the Stonewall and Blitz. Granted, I made 100, and so was my opponent, but I won in 8 moves. What? D, D4, F5. Yo, yo. I, I am so sorry, but the notation needs a little work. I need, need some spacing because this is, I can't see it properly. I'm sorry. Alright. And here's the, uh, the question. Isn't it a waste of time to analyze a club game between two amateurs so deeply? And the answer is, the position illustrates Black's typical kingside attack in the stone wall. The variations show how Black can increase his pressure on g3 and f2, and there may be improvements for White, but his position is very passive, so it's not really likely that he can hope to hold his game together. So we're just looking at some, uh, some regular stuff in the stone wall. Even though this is a club game, this is a lot to uh, it's a lot of information that is here. It's available. Sometimes some club level games show you the mistakes that normal people would make and how how to avoid them. Especially true if you are in a tournament and let's say your opponent is twelve hundred and you are eight hundred. Even though your opponent doesn't understand chess, maybe at the level your coach does. Still review your game with him because he might have some insight on how to get better. Or he might have some insight on how you can get to 1,200. You know, you never know. I, I think the chess community is a good one where we're all trying to 
um, better everybody else's game. So always go over your game if possible with your opponent. That way you can see what he's thinking as well. well like, oh, well, why why did you play this move? Or what, what happened here? Or like, oh, you know, I just didn't see it. Well, okay, now you know he just didn't see it. Okay. Uh, so I want to give you the finish of this game. Bishop captures G3, double exclamation mark. F captures G3. Rook captures F1. This is very nice. <laughs> Queen captures. Checkmate. Note that even if he does take here, we can still checkmate him. Very, very, very nice game. I loved it. I really, I really, really liked it. All right. So we're going to go over some, some more stuff. Let's go over a new analysis. Bam. So inspirational game B. This is Matthew Turner versus uh, Simon Agdestein. D4, F5, G3. I like the stone wall because, and this is a question. I like the stone wall because usually it seems, it seems strategically oriented, but I am worried about White's wild deviations on his second and third turn. Here's the answer. It's not really a question, but here's the answer. You might consider the move order E6 if you are willing to play the French defense, of course. Or even starting off with a semi-slav setup, but just delaying knight f6. However, maybe you should just adjust your attitude toward messy positions. There's no way to stop your opponent from playing strange moves or giving his pawns or giving away his pawns. It may happen not only in the opening, but also in the middle game or even in the end game. And the only way to deal with it is calculation and common sense. True words have never been written. Actually, moves like 2, e4, or g4 should be considered golden opportunities to win with black. These complications may be bewildering, but they start from a position with which you are well acquainted and appear at a stage where your mind normally is fresh and you have plenty of time left on your clock. All right. So you should play knight of six, bishop g2, e6, knight f3, d5. The stone wall is an ideal way to play for a win with black positional and tactical themes mix in a way that almost always favors the stronger player. I like this. Castles. Bishop g6 like normal. c4, c6. Castles, so instead of that, is a Scandinavian specialty. So instead of this, you should is a Scandinavian specialty championed by Augustine and Carl Sen, not the war champion, but another player. The critical lines are c5, gains time, the tempo on the bishop, and queenside space, but a bishop on a6 may become strong, right? So playing here and then here after. Like c5, bishop b7, here, bam, and I want to play my bishop here to attack the light squares. Another critical line is b3. b3 is logical as queen e7 would allow c5. But after b6, oops, after b6, 
black may gain time by playing c5 and one go. So instead of playing c6, c5, you can play c5 and one go. And now this makes more sense because you castled wasting a move. Um, and now you don't have to waste a move here. So theoretically, you would be up a move. But c6, b3, and here we should play queen e7 if I'm not mistaken. Um, but b3, this is clearly white's most popular move. White seeks to exchange dark square bishops with bishop a3, partly in order to demonstrate the superiority of his own light square bishop over that sorry figure on c8, this guy here. Queen e7. He said last time that we should play queen e7 because we don't want him trading off on the a3 f8 diagonal. Okay. Hey, Morzevich, thank you for the host. Um, and where am I reading this? I'm reading this on uh, my phone. I have it, I have the book on my phone. I'm just doing some lessons, Morzevich. I'm doing some lesson on the Stonewall Dutch. So, bishop e7, so queen e7, go back to it, uh, this at least temporarily stops bishop a3, there are alternatives as black shouldn't worry too much about exchanging dark square bishops, but, but why not make the trade a little bit more difficult for white? So, you know that their plan is to trade off the bishop. The reason they played b3 is one to strengthen c4. Another plan is to right, you strengthen c4. And another plan is to play bishop a3 to trade it off. So let's make it let's make it a little bit harder for him to do that. And so he that he has to waste more moves completing his goal. And you shouldn't even fear giving up the dark square bishop or trading the dark square bishop. Bishop b2. White fights for control over e5, but may also follow up with queen c1, preparing a3. So the idea is maybe later on, get the queen here and then play there to trade off. Another popular way to prepare bishop a3 is a4. So instead of playing bishop b2, you can play a4 because now the rook defends it. However, the only non-developing move, knight e5. So, the only non-developing move, knight e5, presents black with any real problems equalizing. Okay. This should be 2, b6. After bishop b2, b6. Speak a little Spanish. Uh, for the lessons, I unfortunately I'm going to speak in English because um, most of my viewers are, in, are English speakers. But on during the blitz time, you got some Spanish. Uh, so b6. Black prepares to develop his bishop to b7 or occasionally to a6. Black weakens c6 somewhat but white isn't ready to exploit the weakness. This developing scheme is particularly effective against slow lines where white spends time exchanging dark square bishops at the expense of development and peace activity. The basic idea behind white's a3 maneuver is to control e5. So I'll illustrate that with some diagonals. The reason that he wants to exchange dark square bishop is so that he can have better control of this square because, right, this bishop is not controlling that square anymore. And that is a good strategy if black runs his light square bishop to the king side. But with the modern b6 setup, the e5 square becomes much less important. There are other important squares. So let's say he plays queen c1 trying to trade off the bishops. This somewhat artificial move prepares the desired exchange on a3. Bishop b7, a3, knight bd7. 
And I have a rule that you guys should maybe follow or try to employ in your games. Never take first. Never take first. You, Unless you're weakening something, you're always helping your opponent. So they take, you take, and queen a3. So c5, the sharpest solution, trying to prove that white's queen is offside on a3. Also, he notes that take, take, and king e7 are just fine for black. The reason we don't castle is because maybe we want the king in the center to come here, and the rooks are perfect where they are right now. And it defends the e6 square. And that's perfectly fine for black. So c5, c captures d5. E captures... Sorry. C captures d5. E captures d5. Knight c3. Maybe it's time to go here. Castles. Rook a c1. Uh, so instead of this game... They have a game where he, somebody played e3 and then knight e4. Knight e4, rook ac1. a6, preventing the knight from going here. Also preparing with some uh, b5 in many cases. Maybe b5, maybe getting the knight here after c4. Um... So knight e4, rook a c1, a6, knight e2, and then g5. All pretty common stuff. Rook f d1. Rook a to e8. So now we no longer are caring about the queen side. Now our attack is in the center and on the king side. Um, queen b2. Queen e7. Maybe trying to transfer over. Knight c3. Although, our, maybe this is more flexible, but whatever. Queen e7, knight c3, f4. D captures c5, f captures e3, f captures c3, knight captures c3, queen captures c3, b captures c5. And this is equal plus. So this is equalish, but black has a smaller advantage. All right. Very nice. So c5, c captures g5, c captures g5. Oh, so, sorry. I got to go through that line again. I see three castles. Rook a c1. F4. Oh, and that one was the uh, European Under-18 Championship. That's the game that I was showing before. Uh, F4. The, stone, the name Stonewall has tricked many white players. The wall is extremely mobile. Okay. A little chess joke there. Rook f d1. And this is nice because you always want to put your rook in line with the opponent's queen. A6. D capture C5. An earlier game. Um, in 2004, white played rook C2. Rook A, E8. And the reason I'm showing you guys the uh, the sublines is not only to go through the, the book, is so that you guys have some knowledge of what to do against other moves that are not like the standard moves. Rook a8, bishop h3, f captures g3, 
Yuji takes the center. Yep, so take the center. H captures G3. Knight H5. Maybe we're planning a little sacrifice. Dizzle over here. Bishop G2. Knight captures G3. F captures G3. Queen captures G3. Rook C. C1. And we play rook E6. Rook F1. I Maybe you have a stronger move. So instead, maybe it's just like... Hmm, maybe knight of six, right? Knight of six, knight h5, knight here maybe? Okay, but let's see what the text has for us. Rook e6. Rook f1. C captures... C captures d4. Knight, rook, c2. I mean, what are you really going to play? Queen, a4? Can't move this knight because rook captures here. Is a terrible way to go out. What are you going to do? This knight is garbage. I don't even have to take this. No. Maybe knight f6. We have so many possibilities. You see, like, we don't even have to take this. That's how good our position is. You see that? Like, if we take this, like, our position is... Is it okay? Two rooks, two rooks. Bishop, knight, bishop, knight. Nah, we sacrifice a knight. So, maybe we should get something better out of it. Maybe knight e5. Oh, okay. What happens if knight captures d5? Then, um... Queen e3 check, right? Queen e3. Rook and blockers we're going to take. If here, then rook h6. Right? Um, go say queen captures d4, and then knight g4. e4, d captures d4, knight e2. Yeah. Buenos dias. <laughs> you know, I've never played a game of chess in my life. Always been a connect four man. Well, welcome to the chess stream. <laughs> Hopefully now you you have the resources to play with black. I'm confident that you do. Okay, so let's go back. This is this is a losing position for this guy. Um I mean we can play like this. We can play we can play this. There's there's so many moves here. Like Yeah, you can't even take here. Because if you take bishop takes, so let's say king g1, we can take here. We can play here. Let's play here, right? And then the, the rook has to take knight captures. This rook is under fire. And we're coming over here. This is, this is totally awesome for us. Maybe if here, then... I mean, we have we have so many moves. Hey, welcome to the stream. UNDTR. I like that. Or should I call you NDTR? I don't know which one to call you, but we're learning about the the Dutch. Okay, so let's go back. So F. D captures, B captures, knight g5. Oh, he played f5, right? And then f4. Rook fd1, D captures c5. Captures c5. C captures c5, B captures c5, knight g5. Captures 
captures knight g4, threatening this knight f3, rook a e8, coming in for the attack. Black increases his pressure. Next, he plans queen h6, um, foul, and uh, knight d e5. So, white, stri white tries to fend off the attack by tactical means. It backfires badly, but it seems white had serious problems anyways. And then we blundered. No, did he not blunder? Oh, no, he didn't blunder. Okay, so knight captures f2. This spectacular move wins, but Fritz points out that the prosaic uh, knight, queen e6 is stronger. So instead of knight captures f2, you play queen e6 and it's a little bit stronger. So we'll, we'll go over both. Queen e6. Rook d2, queen h6, d4 is also, d4 is also a move here. All we need is that to go there. King captures, then we have queen e3 check. Uh, he has two squares to go to. If he chooses, whichever one he chooses doesn't matter. Let's say he plays f1 and then knight e5. Can't take. We're coming into the house. And yeah, we're collecting. Knight b1. What happens if he plays here to attack the queen? The queen can take on a3, right? So we can't take there. So let's say queen b1 to attack the queen this way. We play d3 to interpose. Uh, rook captures d3. Uh, I think we can just capture on d3. Uh, if queen captures d3, then we capture on c1, right? So we can't do that. So let's say pawn captures, and then rook captures f3. He has to go this way, and then we can checkmate him. Okay. I, I like uh, queen e6 a little bit better. So this is true. I do prefer queen e6. But knight captures f2 is also, it's it's pretty. It's very pretty. Knight got queen e7. I think both queen e7 and queen e5 work. Queen e7. Rook d, d1. Oops, sorry. Rook d to d1. Uh, d4. He, and it, they said that no better is knight d3. Oh, sorry, rook d3 because of knight e5. And probably white's best try was rook f4 instead. That was probably white's best try. But after queen e3 check. Uh, and then king f1, rook captures f4. Sorry, rook captures f4 after that. Um, black can win a piece and, can, and he's still attacking. So d4 here. Oops, let's go back. Rook d, d1, d4. King g1. And they said, um, if if knight a4 protecting the knight, there's actually mate. <laughs> Queen g2. And then mate follows after rook captures f3. The best defense is this. And then queen e3 check. King h2. Knight f6. I, I would have never found this. Rook captures d4. C captures d4. 
Is it not a faster way to mate? Yeah, and this is made in nine. What? I would never have found this. That's what uh, Ripka announces. Jesus. Okay, well now I know at least. Well, let's go through it. I want to see that. I want to see the mate. Bam, bam, bam. Rook captures queen b2. Queen e3 check. King h2. Let's get the best resistance. If king h here, then rook e6. Then he has to play king h2 anyways. Okay. Uh, so king h2 first. Rook e6. Or knight of 6. Both win. Both are made in 8. Rook e6. Rook captures d4. C captures d4. Rook c8 check. Just giving away the pieces. Uh, let's play king f7. Rook f8. And it captures. Queen cut. Yeah, let's just play a 3. Rook h6. Oops. Rook h6 check. Bishop h3. Rook f2 check. King g1. Rook captures b2 check. King f1. Rook b1 mate. Wow. Insane combination. Insane in the brain. D4. King g1. All right. So let's go back to the win. So d4, king g1, king, queen e3, king h2. And I think the uh, common idea should be known that it's rook e6, right? I'm pretty sure you just played rook e6 here. Oh, he played knight f6. He said that in the book, he says that both of these win, but he played knight f6. Uh, I. I just feel like this is so much stronger. Like, why why not bring the rook? Like, if I can if I can do a rook lift, a rook lift is basically where I bring the rook up and then I move the rook over. I'm o I love rook lifts. I, I'm always doing that. I'm playing rook e6 all the time. And this is a common idea that so far that we've seen in the in the stone wall. Um, but okay, let's play knight f6. Queen captures c5. Oh, wait. Sorry, sorry. He played king h2. Maybe that's the difference. But still, I played rook e6. Queen captures c5. Knight g4 check. King h3, knight f2 check. He says that uh, actually rook e5 is the most direct win. I mean, I, yeah, I guess. I can see that. Um, but, uh, okay. Knight f2. But he says that the repetition brings uh, black to time control. Remember that they have a time event. If after 40 moves, they get an additional time bonus. So I think that's why he went for this line. H3. That is true here and takes. Time is a factor. Knight captures on d1, attacking the queen. Queen h6, check, question mark. The right move was to play captures and maintaining all the pressure. 
And then after queen c4, queen capture c4, uh, rook capture c4. Um, and then bishop captures f3. Bishop captures f3, rook captures f3. And then rook e2 check, king h3. Uh, it's, it's winning game. But um, he played queen h6 check. Wow. King g1. The uh, losing move. The, he should just play here. Knight h4 is far from clear. But whatever. You know, that it's not a perfect game. You know, we're human. Rook c8. And now black wins easily. Uh, knight g5, question mark. Rook capture c5. Rook capture c5. Queen d6. Maybe he thought that he has two knights for the queen, so it should be enough. Ninety six. If we take, they take, right? So we're going to take first. And yeah, this game is over. Oh, your laptop died. Oh, my laptop just finished dying too. I had to get a new computer because I was streaming from uh, my computer. My laptop, so. Okay. Um,. We have one more game to go through, and then uh, we are going to call a wrap for this uh, this Stonewall session. This is, this is really a lot of knowledge. Like, I'm, I'm going to rewatch myself because I, w I really want to understand this. And uh, for those of you who have not yet followed or do not know about it, here is my social. Um, I update my Instagram every day with tactics and my YouTube channel has all the lessons uh, uploaded. So they're none of the blitz, just the chess lessons. Um, so make sure that you hit the notification bell, the subscribe button, the follow, follow me everywhere. It won't, I won't lead you astray. Okay, so this is uh, the Norwegian Team Championship in 2000, in the year 2000, um, before some of you guys were born. So D4. Black can meet most moves except for E4 and G4 with F5. So you can you can do it against C4, B4, A4, and F4 and H4. Knight F3. Knight c3 with f5. g3. A lot of moves you can meet with f5. With f5 heading for a stonewall setup, but in many cases e6, d5 are safer move orders if this otherwise fits your repertoire. So there's a question here. Will you examine these moves in detail? d4 somewhat weakens e4 so f5 um contesting this square is a logical reaction um this isn't the case with c4 and knight f3 so meeting uh these moves with f5 seems less logical nevertheless it's quite practical to strive for the same setup against all closed systems so we shall discuss these lines in lesson 12. f5 g3 C4 followed by G3 would normally transpose to win the lessons, but allows Black the extra option of Bishop B4 against certain lines. So Knight F6, Bishop G2, E6. Um, you you could play D5 here instead. Is what the text is saying. You can play D5 here. But it sacrifices flexibility for no obvious reason. 
even if you know what you're planning to do, there's no need to inform your important your imp opponent. Uh, alternatives include d6. All right, so you can play d6 here. You can play g6 here. There's no rush to play d5. So e6 is a so d6 can lead into Leningrad, into the classical, into the Hort and solution uh, system all rather relevant for our stonewall repertoire or g6 can lead into the leningrad dutch an extremely challenging and dynamic system but even if there are some minor lines where black plays d5 it's also not relevant to our discussion of the stonewall so do sacrifice your flexibility guys keep it keep it stable just play six because you can play you can play d5 later c4 Black's alternative, you can play c6 here, but they recommend that you play d5. But you can do both. Bishop e7 is also another move here. Uh, and it originally was the most popular prelude to the Stonewall variation after knight f3, castle, castle. And then you can play d6, and this is the original form of the classic Dutch. And it has little relevance for our suggested repertoire, but it should be noted that we recommend to set up pawns d6, e6, f5 against an early knight h3. So we're going to learn that later on. You can also play c6. Wait, N not here. So he's talking about in this line where bishop e7, bishop e7, knight f3, castles, castles, and then you can play c6, and this is another idea, is an intent to stay flexible, waiting to see where white develops the, his knights before deciding whether to play d6 or d5. Good. Okay. Alakine's uh, 94 is a slightly time-consuming attempt to remain flexible regarding the central formation. In certain lines, black supports his knight with d5, reaching a stone wall formation. The other move is d5. Is the basic position of the classical stone wall and is closely related to the modern stone wall with the bishop at d6, but won't be a subject of these lessons. Okay. So let's go back to the text. We're just going to play d5. And then knight h3. And if you guys have any questions in the chat, feel more than free to just ask away. I, I know some of you guys are just enjoying the show, but ask questions if you have any questions. You know, this is a learning experience for all of us. And if you have me explain stuff, maybe some other people have the same questions that are too shy to ask them. Okay. Night history. This is one of the critical lines of the Stonewall Dutch, the knight heading for F4, but first it frequently supports a bishop development to f4. Normal development with knight f3 is examined unless it's 1 through 6. Okay. This is just the invitation. What's the current theoretical status of the stone wall? That's the question right here. And the answer is, in the period 1985 to 1990, the modern stone wall dodge was a hot topic in top-level chess. Since then, the interest has cooled somewhat. That isn't a result of any major theoretical problems, but rather reflects that the fact that this is now well-explored terrain. The normal result of a stone wall contested at the top level today is that white achieves a cosmetically better position and both players are happy. White to reach a comfortable position against a defense he doesn't face very frequently and black to have reached a familiar position that he's confident that he can hold. 
So at the top level, it's still considered good. So you can carry the system to the top level. Why you achieve a comfortable position, you achieve a comfortable position. Everybody's happy. Okay. C6. Castles. Bishop G6. Queen C2. They said that uh, bishop f4 is actually a little more common. And you're supposed to play bishop e7. Then black will try to demonstrate that the knight on h3 is out of play. Most frequently we're playing h6 and g5. Okay. Very nice. That's a really good idea. Don't exchange the bishops. So bishop, queen c2. And then knight a6. Black sharpens the struggle by eliminating white's option to exchange his dark square bishop for the knight. So he plays knight a6 so that he can't play bishop f4 to take. So like let's say he castled here. Then bishop f4, bishop e7, and then takes is what he wants to avoid. Given that much of the struggle in the stonewall revolves around the e5 square, wouldn't knight bd7 be more natural? And then the answer is knight bd7 is untested too, possibly because after, and let's go back, bishop f4, e7, black's vulnerable to knight g5. More interestingly, we shall see that this knight development to the edge over and over again, even in positions where no such considerations are relevant. Essentially, black is claiming that control over the e5s isn't such a big deal, and there are other important squares on the board as well. With three white minor pieces hovering over the e5 square, let's, uh, just, let's go back and note them. Oh, here. Oops, this line. Right, we're just around these squares, right? With three white minor pieces hovering over the e5 square, black may even point out that only one of them can actually occupy it, it making the other two superfluous pieces in uh, Deveretsky's terminology. Deveretsky. <laughs> We're going through his book, right? Uh, the Endgame book. And then Knight D2. Okay, so Knight D2 here. F4, E7 might still have led to the play into the traditional spaz. Castle. Knight F3. Knight H5. This is a slightly unconventional way to fight for the f4 square. Knight e4 or h6 looks more familiar. Knight f4. Knight captures, bishop captures, bishop captures, g captures. This pawn structure is quite popular as white gains total control over e5. The key to black's play is that he can easily organize g5. And therefore controls the timing for the kingside clash. Knight c7. Knight c7. E3. So let's go into a line that they give, which is b4. Cost white a pawn after d6, right? So we're attacking both of these pawns. 
And if queen d2, g captures c4, right? So now rook fc1. Oops, sorry. Missed a move. Knight e5, knight d5. Now attacking both of these pieces again. Knight captures c4. Oops, knight captures c4. Queen captures here. And this is still okay. So instead, knight c3, e3, queen e7. Rook fc1, getting the play on the queen side going. Uh, king h8, maybe threatening this here. Queen b3, knight e8, a4. And he said the alternative, queen a3 is harmless after queen captures a3. And then um, knight d6, c5, and knight f7. And then we still have our all our all of our ideas. Okay. So let's go to the point where he she plays a4. Oops. Knight e8. Queen b3. Knight e8. A4. Okay, and the question here is, isn't black rather passive here? White may be somewhat better, but there is not much he can attack, and black can free his game with knight d8, bishop d7, e8, h5, and rook c8, c7, and eventually break up the king side with a well time g5. So the idea is knight d6. Queen a3, bishop g7, a5. Um, now white's queen play immediately comes to an end, but after b4, b5 wasn't easy to force anyways. Okay, but he he gives this line a6 instead. What happens after it takes? You take here, right? So we can't do that because the knight's pinned. Right? The bishop is still bad. The rooks don't have any movement. So yeah, let's just stop his queenside play. Uh, knight e5. Wait, what am I doing? a6, knight e5. Bishop e8. And this maneuver is like really common. Before even studying this, I like I kind of knew that this is what you had to do to get this bishop out. Um, so bishop e8, rook c2, bishop h5. And it's great that this g-pawn is in here. Bishop h5, rook ac1. Rook a d8. And I have no problems here. I think that black is... This is an even game, and black is even... I mean, it's, it's equal, but I think that black has more chances. Oh, and they say that uh, if you don't play rook eight d eight and instead you play bishop here, you can play bishop f three. So rook g eight is an inaccuracy, and 
you cannot meet it with bishop captures f3 due to queen captures d6. Right? The queen has to move away and then we're taking after. Because if you take, then it's checkmate. Very nice. So instead, we play rook a d8. So king h1, rook g8 now, queen b4, rook d f8, b3, g5. The fact that it's mainly black deciding when the king side action starts doesn't make it easy to time correct time it correctly. With both players approaching time trouble, it seemed right to complicate. In hindsight, it, it's clear that white has sufficient defensive resources. Maybe this is a little bit too premature is what he's saying. So knight g3. And f captures g5 is met with f4. H4, H6. White can gain some counterplay with uh, C captures D5. Uh, e captures D... Oops. E captures D5. Knight captures C6. B captures C6. Rook captures C6. Well, black should win after Rook G6. E captures F4. Queen F7. And if rook captures d6, queen captures f4. This is just for example, rook d to c6, queen captures h4. King g1, queen captures. And... King h1, rook captures g5. We're pretty much in familiar territory because we know what to do in these positions. Queen captures f8. Queen captures f8. Rook c8. Bishop e8 blocking the rook. Rook e1. King h7. Rook c captures e8. Queen f2. Rook 1 e7. Check. And rook g7. And this should be winning for black. That was a lot to go over, guys. Uh, so let's go over G captures H4. So this is move 25. Knight D3. G captures F4. Knight captures F4. Rook captures G2. If king captures g2, okay, so knight, so white is mated after knight captures g2 because you can play f3, right? And now the, this can't come back. Rook g1 defending. Rook g8 attacking again. Queen e1. Queen h4.
and rook here. However, let's see. However, knight captures here is good. Okay. So if king captures, which is a question mark as well, rook g8 check. So king captures rook g8 check, rook f1, bishop f3, making sure that the king cannot escape. Knight e2, rook g2, knight g1, question mark, rook captures g1, captures, queen g7 check, king f1, knight e4, creating the mating net. So all these squares are blocked off and we're going to come down with the queen and checkmate the mating net has been spun and white's king is helplessly abandoned by his queen side troops and that is it for the introduction to the stonewall dutch so now you guys have enough material to base some of your opening plays on good luck <laughs> um I, I really want to do these opening series more. This is actually really entertaining and really fun. Like, I, I really got to understand the opening a little bit better. Um, so I think I'm going to be doing this a little bit more often. Again, if you haven't already, please hit the like button, the subscribe, hit the notification bell if uh, you like what you see here. If you don't, leave a comment. Tell me what I can improve on. Um, and that's that's a wrap. Thank you, guys, and thank you for supporting.